All right, welcome back. Let's continue on asset allocation and related decisions in portfolio management principles of asset allocation. Now, some nice review here. Okay, so let's start off by talking about mean variance optimization. We're all familiar with this, right? So what do we do? We start with the inputs that we need expected returns, standard deviation, correlations. Then what do we do? We feed that into our supercomputer. It might just be Solver in Excel or something more sophisticated, some sort of computer software so that we can generate this mean variance optimization. And the goal here, to find the absolute best portfolio at all points along the curve so we can draw that efficient frontier and find the asset allocations that get us where us and our clients want to go. So typically when we run these optimizations, there have to be some constraints, right? It's a constrained optimization. So first one is that the weights have to sum to one. In other words, all the investments have to total up 100% of the wealth, of the value that we're trying to invest here. Second thing has to be non-negativity. So typically, nearly all the clients that we're going to have, they're not going to be interested in short positions. So that means the weights need to be zero or positive. Certainly in theory, we can do whatever we want, right? If we have somebody that's uh, very risk tolerant and very happy to have short positions and willing to give us permission to do that, then we can take away that constraint. But typically, non-negativity is one of those constraints. Then also, the client, well, the client's going to say, quite often, they don't want to take on a level of risk greater than some certain level, or they need a minimally acceptable return that has to be above and beyond some certain level. There may also have some restrictions in terms of what they're interested in, in terms of weight. So they may be a little bit more nervous of a portfolio that has too much in stocks, or maybe they're very risk tolerant and say, I don't want to be too much in bonds. So those can be some client imposed constraints. All right, so let's do an example here. We've got an input here with some data, and we're going to feed it in and figure out what our efficient frontier looks like. Okay, so we have four asset classes here, domestic equity, non-domestic equity, domestic bonds, and real estate. Okay, so let's take a look at, for a moment, at those expected returns and standard deviations, right? We can kind of eyeball those and get a sense of how much bang we're getting for our buck, right? How much return we're getting for each unit of risk. So domestic equity, 10% expected return with only 11% standard deviation. Non-domestic equity, 14% expected return with 16% standard deviation. Domestic bonds, 6 and 8 respectively, and then real estate, 16 and 19. So are these four asset classes, real estate has not only the highest expected return, but also the highest amount of standard deviation. So as we sort of churn through these results using the data that's in here in this data table, well, we can start to get some intuition behind the results that we're going to see based upon the numbers that we have here in front of us. Now, we can also look at the correlation coefficients. Notice that um, some of them are negative, some of them are positive. What do we see here? For example, um, non-domestic equity has a negative correlation with domestic bonds, for example. So those correlations are going to certainly play a role in the overall portfolio risk level. So we have our constraints, 100% allocation, right? The weights have to add up to one, and we can only have non-negative weights. The resulting efficient frontier, you see it there. So what we do after we load that data into our statistical package, we run an optimization, say the weights have to sum to one, we can have uh, no negative weights. And what we are looking for is the portfolios that have the lowest standard deviation for every level of return, or if you want to think of it from the other direction, the highest return per level of standard deviation on the x-axis. So we find each one of those portfolios, we draw a line through them, that gives us our efficient frontier. Okay, so we're going to mark off four points here. We're going to mark off the two endpoints, one and four there, and then also two points there, two and three. And the role of those points is that we're going to refer to those as corner portfolios. They're not corners per se because it's a curve. Um, however, sort of think of them as inflection points, right? Is that you can see sort of how the slope is changing as we sort of move along each one of those four points there. So the asset allocations for those points between those corner portfolios, well, we can just calculate them as a linear interpolation of those two bracketing corner portfolios. So if I want to, let's say, find something that's actually in between three and four, well, then I can do a linear interpolation where three and four are my two endpoints there and figure out the point in between that I want to be at on the curve. So we can do that just by interpolating those two corners and then finding the point that's in between, giving us that same weighted average return. Now, if we want to look at this from a different direction, okay, so this is a different graph. Notice that it is weights on the y-axis and standard deviation on the x-axis. So we can look at where all four of these portfolios lie. So this is a different sort of graph you may or may not have seen a graph like this before. But just to uh, just sort of draw your attention to a couple of things here. So if we're looking at um, the asset class that had the lowest standard deviation, well, that was domestic bonds. And so notice that that is furthest to the left 
on the x-axis, right? Because it has the lowest standard deviation. On the top of the graph here, you see the four corner portfolio. So if you look in the upper right corner, if you look at the number one up there, well, that is the weights for the portfolio if we put all of our money in real estate, right? So the portfolio number one, which was sort of the furthest point in the upper right on the efficient frontier, well, that would be a portfolio that would be 100% invested in real estate. And so as a result, we would get the standard deviation of real estate, which was 19%, and then also its expected return, which was 16%. So these points in between, if we look at portfolio two, portfolio three, portfolio four, what this tells us are the relative weights of each asset class. So if we look at point three, for example, all right, and we sort of start at the bottom there where the domestic equity section is. So portfolio three has, has somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the portfolio value invested in domestic equity. All right. Then non-domestic equity is kind of the next layer up there. And uh, so, you know, that goes from, let's say, 35 percent to about 60 percent. So let's say non-domestic equity has about a 25 percent weight in portfolio three. And then it appears that pretty much the rest of it is real estate. So notice that domestic bonds don't really play a role in corner portfolio number three. So as we make the efficient frontier, what are we going to find? We're going to find a wide variety of asset allocations that get us to these points along the efficient frontier, with the goal being that, yeah, we have a wide variety of portfolios to choose from depending upon the type of client that we're trying to service. All right, so here are the table of actual weights that match that uh, graph that we saw on the prior slide. So if we start with allocation one, that's the one that is entirely 100% real estate. So it's going to have an expected return and standard deviation of real estate that we had in that early table. So 16% expected return, 19% standard deviation. If you look down at allocation three, that was the one we were talking about on the last slide also. It started out with, I said between 30 and 40% domestic equity. I kind of eyeballed it as being about 35%. It's actually closer to 39, 38.91, then 22.77% of non-domestic equity, and then the rest is real estate. Notice that domestic bonds didn't have a weight in that portfolio allocation, or the first two. The only portfolio that actually has domestic bonds with any sort of weight is allocation four, which is far and away the portfolio that has the lowest expected return and lowest standard deviation. And again, that's because it's the most heavily weighted in bonds with 68% in domestic bonds, whereas the other allocations had zero. Well, domestic bonds were the lowest risk, lowest return category. And so as a result, that's the lowest risk, lowest expected return portfolio allocation. So when selecting the optimal mix for any investor, well, various approaches can be taken, right? So we can put them in any one of those four points if we think they're applicable. We can also take an interpolation between any of those two points, weighting um, the difference in any way that we wish in order, in order to get any sort of allocation that we wish to choose from that falls on that efficient frontier. Okay, now another approach toward figuring out what the optimal allocation is for a client is we can use a utility maximization approach. Okay, so there's our utility function here. And so we're going to start with the utility, that U sub Z there. Okay, and so that's going to be equal to the expected return. And then we're going to subtract from that that second term. And that second term includes the variance, the sigma squared Z. Okay, and so if we look at that coefficient lambda there, that's their coefficient of risk aversion. Now, you may also see this written as R sub A. Okay, so that's another term that gets used instead of lambda. If you learn that in a different context, different textbook, whatever, that R sub A and lambda, they mean the same thing. It's just risk aversion. So the more risk aversion, the higher that coefficient is, well, the more they are going to dislike risk, the more it's going to take away utility that they're getting out of their portfolios. Okay, so lambda or R sub A typically runs from between one and 10 in terms of its value. A zero lambda would be an investor that's risk neutral. In other words, they don't care about volatility. All they do is care about expected returns. They ignore risk otherwise. In practice, it's pretty difficult to determine an investor's lambda. So, you know, one to 10, we would say 10 is very high, one is very low, zero is risk neutral. However, to try and quantify that with an investor, that's actually a relatively difficult thing. So while we have a um, quantitative construct here with this utility function, really we want to pull the intuition out of this. Certainly we'll plug some numbers to this in the practice problems, but again, the intuition here is that obviously higher lambda means that investor um, enjoys return, but really dislikes risk, more risk takes away their utility.
All right. So if uh, that coefficient of 0 0.005, we plug it in that way as a decimal term if we have everything else in percentages. So if the expected return is 15% and the variance is 20% in whole numbers and percentages, then we say, I'm sorry, that coefficient is uh, 0 0.005. If they are written as decimals, so 15% is 0.15 and uh, the variance is 0.2, then we put that coefficient as 0.5, basically to keep the terms similar regardless of whether we're using decimals or percentages. All right, next we can try a safety first approach. Let's say we have a client that says we absolutely have to earn this rate of return. Maybe that uh, client is uh, a pension fund. And so you need to earn a minimum return so that you know that the checks are going to go out on time and that you maintain the surplus of the pension. So what you're going to do is structure the portfolio so that you minimize the probability of violating that minimum acceptable return. So we call this the safety first criterion. Sometimes it's uh, referred to as Roy's safety first criterion. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take that safety first criterion to be equal to something that looks a lot like the Sharpe ratio there. It's going to be the expected return of the market minus the minimally expected return divided by the standard deviation of the market. And so that looks a lot like the um, Sharp ratio, right? If we took that minimum acceptable return out and put the risk-free rate in there, well then, or to think of it as we're treating the risk-free rate as the minimum acceptable return, well then the safety first criterion looks very much like the Sharp ratio. So what we're trying to do here, right, we're trying to sort of figure out how we minimize the probability of violating that minimum acceptable return. And so we call this the Roy safety first criterion. Now some other approaches. Let's say a client says, I want to earn at least this return. So we have a required return. We want to find the portfolio from the efficient frontier that provides it. So we, okay, we look at our efficient frontier. Let's say it looks something like this. And so that client says, you know what? I want to earn an average return or expected return of 10%. So we say, okay, we go over to the curve, come down here. That portfolio is going to have that standard deviation and that expected return, okay? Now, the client could come at this from a different direction and say, okay, I don't want to take on a risk level above this number, a standard deviation above this number. So then we go along the x-axis and we say, okay, the client says, this is our maximum standard deviation that we're willing to tolerate. Okay, so then we take that and we go up to the efficient frontier and come over and we say, okay, this is going to be the expected return that you earn given the maximum that you've told us that you want to take on in standard deviation. Okay, next thing, cash equivalent. So in portfolio theory, the risk-free rate is a known return with a zero standard deviation and zero correlation to other assets. So if we look at this from the short run perspective, right? if we look at a single period model, then the risk-free rate basically is a y-intercept. right? It's something at a standard deviation of zero that sits on the y-axis. And so what that allows us to do then is we can create a tangency portfolio. So when we find the optimal portfolio, namely the one out of all of the efficient frontier portfolios that has the highest sharp ratio, we figure out what that point is and we draw a line from the risk-free rate through that point. That's what we call the tangency portfolio. And so it allows us to find that capital allocation line. If you remember this back from when we were talking about the CAPM. So that's in a single period model. Now, in a multi-period model, a continuous time model, really what we're looking for here is to say that, yeah, cash basically is just another asset class. It will have effectively zero risk, but it will be positive. And so in that case, the frontier just becomes the frontier itself. We're not going to have a tangency line um, going across from the y-axis to it. So we include cash simply as another type of portfolio. So if somebody has a long-run portfolio perspective, they're looking for a high rate of return and they're willing to take on a certain degree of risk uh, to do so, then their optimal um, portfolio allocation is probably going to be relatively light in cash type of investments.